so I do like to give a bit of a, a Surgeon General's warning that my talk might be hazardous to your preconceptions about this issue. Um, and I'll explain why. Uh, I'm going to occupy the first half of the uh, session and give you all the gory details as I see it. And, and then Dr. Stryfer is going to lead a discussion on perhaps some of the solutions, both uh, individually, as a college, and maybe as a community, and even more as a region and a nation. Um, I, I take off on one point, for instance, that uh, one of the spokespeople in this film, Kelly Brownell at Yale, uh, has made in an interview that I heard on National Public Radio about this documentary, where he says that uh, when asked how he knows that some of his proposals about regulation of the food industry um, is going to work, he says, well, look at the success of that smoking. And, you know, I think I know something about that. And, and uh, if you look at the, quote, success about smoking, which is now called tobacco control, you know, like mosquito control, you know, you think of government regulation as maybe only being one piece of the puzzle. And I've been working on this a long time, and it's taken 50 years from the time the Surgeon General's report came out on smoking to some of the... Uh, the progress that we've made. Now, in fairness, we have reduced our prevalence of smoking from roughly 40% to 20%. You can't beat that. And I think the sine qua non of that success has been with the regulation of clean indoor air. So we're considering a college-wide uh, smoke-free policy that should be enforced very soon. I doubt there'd be anybody disagreeing. But what about if we were going to propose that we eliminate soda machines and snack machines? And uh, I don't know whether that would be quite as unanimous right now, even as as, as much momentum as we have going with these discussions. We've uh, also traded off numbers by not realizing that the cohort of people who are smoking today is younger than ever. Uh, we have about 53 million people still smoking today, and we had that exact same number in 1964. Now, the population is much greater, but if you were an executive, which would you rather have, a bunch of 20-somethings thinking they're invulnerable, as we now have with the cigarette issue, or a bunch of hacking, wheezing, coughing, 70, 80-year-olds, as we used to have. So I think that, it, again, I'm not so certain that Kelly Brownell has a good analogy by saying, look at the success we've had from smoking. Because I don't think we're anywhere near the regulatory opportunities on food that we had with the tobacco industry, which we demonized as big tobacco. We also sued them. So I'm going to take apart some of that argument about what to do, and I'm going to throw it back to us what we can do and not wait for the government to do it. We also have more women smoking today, by the way. So again, progress is a two-edged sword. More lung cancer is being diagnosed among women than among men. We did start with the removal of the cigarette machines. I remember how difficult it was when I worked for the American Medical Association to get the cigarette machine out of the AMA building in 1980. I was told to mind my own business. <laughs> um, as as um, in terms of banning food advertising and trying to get some of the uh, regulation to them, well, in 1988 I was offered the editorship of the journal The American Family Physician. And uh, that's the American Academy of Family Physicians journal that goes out to every family physician. It's the largest single specialty publication in the United States. And I got the contract, and the last paragraph said the editor will not be permitted to discuss the subject of smoking. That's 1988. And I brought back the contract and I said, this is, what is this? What if I were an expert on AIDS or something? You wouldn't say I couldn't talk. I said, no, 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 no. We want your identity to be different now. We want you only to deal with the journal and not get off on a soapbox about anything. Well, come to find out the Academy was accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars from the tobacco industry, even in 1988, in the form of food subsidiaries, General Foods, Kraft, Nabisco, Fleischmann's Margarine, Egg Beaters was the sponsor of the breakfast for 8,000 members of the American Academy of Family Physicians. And we were ostracized, those of us who protested this, and that was carried over into the contract that they offered me, which I couldn't accept. But again, even our own academy in family medicine wasn't about to rock the boat of the tobacco industry, which at that time had acquired food subsidiaries to give them some sheep's clothing and insulate them from public attacks on tobacco. And that's how I got interested, actually, from my experience with the Academy, with the food issue. So I started collecting almost everything I could see in terms of the food subsidiaries of the tobacco industry and how the media were portraying them and how the media themselves weren't questioning anything to do about the food industry. And so what I'd like to show you is uh, a rapid-fire, image-based overview of where we've been over the last 25 years in terms of the mass media and tobacco. 
Um, the headline in the Birmingham News in 2005 was <coughs> Obesity May Cut Lifespan. Well, it sounds pretty commonsensical, but uh, in fact, it took a study at UAB, among other places, to uh, show that we weren't quite certain up until this particular study that although we'd seen health problems arise from obesity, that it really actually shortened lifespan. In fact, a New England Journal of Medicine article a few years earlier in the, in the 1980s didn't show a great deal of um, longevity affected by uh, obesity per se, or overweight per se. So uh, this was, in fact, a rather revolutionary discovery in 2005. And then we began seeing more studies uh, that suggest, and of course, the, the cartoon I saw the other day was uh, studies show that more people are involved in studies. Um, but uh, it, this a study in the Journal of, uh, American Journal of Preventive Medicine showed that 3.5 million uh, of 3.5 million U.S. adults showed that in just 15 years from 1993 to, to 2008, Whereas the proportion of those who smoked fell by 18%, the proportion of obese people rose by 85%. So now we're running almost neck and neck with the smoking issue. And it is indeed on track uh, easily to surpass smoking. I remember when my colleagues in the tobacco field started hearing the CDC reporting all these figures, they were up in arms and they were, oh, this is terrible, that's not true. Well, it's as if their, their turf was being threatened, their grants were being threatened. I don't know what it was. They were fighting the notion that obesity could possibly be worse than smoking. And uh, it's sad that we've divided ourselves into little fiefdoms on this issue. We're not working together. From the Crimson White, uh, obesity rate now at one third. Now, this was a telephone survey in 2010 that suggested that even though people had underreported their own obesity and overweight. In fact, even self-reported telephone surveys were catching up to the generally accepted figure of about 34% of American, uh, prevalence of American obesity. And indeed, that rate is projected to be 42% in less than 20 years. Now, the, the good news is that it's supposed to plateau around 2030. And I, but it's, it's like we're in the middle of a crisis that, has, that we have just almost awakened to. When we distinguish obesity from overweight, we're talking now uh, at least 61%, and that figure rose in just uh, a few years between 19, uh, I think 1998 to 2003, it rose by 5%. It's that rapidly going up. So here's an interesting way that the CDC was enlisted to get involved in this issue, since they changed the name to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They were asked by the State Health Department in West Virginia to come in to investigate childhood obesity. And they did surveys of walking areas, and they went into restaurants and schools and asked about vegetables and fruits, and they came up with statistics showing, indeed, this is almost a contagious disease. So that term uh, of epidemic was actually uh, utilized by the uh, CDC in the early 2000s to describe the rapidly growing obesity epidemic. And the figure that they cited where smoking was about 400,000 preventable deaths or avoidable deaths a year, the number of attributable deaths to obesity when all the other risk factors were eliminated was about 325,000. So here's the map from 91 with uh, you know, a few states still uh, holding their obesity <coughs> level quite low to even states such as Colorado slipping by 1998. And here's the more colorful graphic map that we don't want to look at here because we're number three. And I never heard anybody yell, hey, we're, but this is um, where we fit. Mississippi certainly is uh, there at 31.6%, West Virginia 30.6%, and we are third as of 2008 at 30.1%. We're still considered the second fattest state, according to the Birmingham News. And um, this was a report from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, F as in fat, how obesity is threatening America's future. Um, the report further in indicated that we're only sixth among uh, overweight children. So maybe that's a bit of a, a good news there. Uh, but clearly, we are neck and neck with Mississippi in that regard. And Scott Stantis, the former cartoonist of the Birmingham News, <coughs> said, thank God for Mississippi. Um, you know, that's, that's the way we've been portrayed. I, I think it's, it's not a bad thing. It gives us incentive to get out of that shadow. Um, but here, in Greene County, for instance, singled out as perhaps the most obese county in the United States or among the very most. And I think it's hitting very close to home. So when you have lemons, 
let's try to make lemonade. And I appreciate the opportunity to have us to begin that discussion on what to do. I'm very upset about the loss, pending loss of most of the Birmingham news. Um, they've done some great things. They've, they've really been a great voice for UAB. They've, they've helped promote good health. And they're going to go under to three days a week in, in next month. And this was a series that they did just a couple of years ago. Actually, this is about a decade ago on obe Alabama's obesity epidemic. We have a lot of denial in Alabama. And it's worse for minority populations. We're really uh, <coughs> slipping. And uh, the, the, this article talked about teenage obesity bypass surgery as a possible solution. I mean, it, we've, we've, we've gone down that route, and it's, it's pretty tragic. Um, obese teenagers in a Swedish study were found to die prematurely as people who smoked heavy. So I don't need to keep repeating the dire news, but it's, it's not looking good. In, 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 uh, in this New Mexico case, a three-year-old was removed from his family at age one. He weighed 50 pounds. Uh, it's, it's astonishing, and, and that's what has happened. Uh, children age one to two require about 950 calories a day. But the study here uh, found that uh, that for that age group, 1,220 calories was, was average. And it goes up considerably. 9% uh, of children 9 months to 11 months of age are ate fries at least once per day. For those 19 months to 2 years old, more than 20% had fries daily. Hot dogs, sausage, and bacon were also daily staples for many children. 7% of the 9 to 11 month group and 25% of the older age group. More than 60% of 12 months old had dessert or candy at least once a day. So just more of the mimicry going on. And about one in five women who gets pregnant is already overweight, so we have, or is already obese, so we have problems now obstetrically that we hadn't seen before. And it even extends to the veterinary world. I mean, uh, it could be <laughs> the original fat cat, but uh, they're reflecting our own uh, eating habits as well. So I show this slide because it's dated 1990. Physicians joined to that issue. Well, some of us were out there in the 60s, and, and, and uh, Dr. Oxner in New Orleans was, was there in the 40s, and DeBakey, and, and, uh, and even this issue goes back, you could actually trace in the medical literature to 1910, that we recognized smoking and lung cancer. And by 1928, the New England Journal had a very good paper showing proof positive epidemiologically what this was doing. By 1948, Hill and Dahl, the classic epidemiologic proof using a cohort of physicians to show that physicians who smoked had, you know, many-fold increase in lung cancer, whereas lung cancer was virtually non-existent among those who did not smoke. Two-thirds of physicians smoked in 1950 when that came out, and now only about 5% of physicians smoke. So they read the literature, they took the advice. And I just cite this because if it took till 1990 for groups like the Institute of Medicine to even issue a report on smoking, Think where we are with, with the obesity issue. We're not even beginning to address this issue. We're just uh, doing documentaries about it. So uh, there's been groups that have been formed, my favorite, least favorite word, coalitions. Uh, of, I mean, a coalition, in my understanding of it, from experience with the smoking issue, is always as strong as the weakest member of that coalition. Oh, I, well, we can't do that. We Remember the Cancer Society saying, oh, no, 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 we can't fight alcohol billboards. We can only fight tobacco billboards. Well, alcohol was a carcinogen, but they wouldn't get involved. And, and you, you see how coalitions don't necessarily have to be very big. They actually should be smaller with people who are like-minded and really want to succeed. Whereas a coalition on the other side of the issue is always, by definition, as strong as the tobacco industry. That's what I've always learned. Uh, when the restaurants were fighting all the smoking bans, they weren't really fighting it. It was the industry feeding them the lines, but they were standing up in front of the tobacco industry to give them cover. And so it is with coalitions on our side. There's a lot of self-interest now in this issue. There's a commercialism aspect to obesity management. Two of our family physician graduates from this residency program have left the field of family medicine to go into, uh, well, as one patient told me, she said, my family doctor called me and said he wasn't going to be my doctor doctor anymore. He was going to be my diet doctor. And uh, I think it's a loss because I think this is something we can all do in our practices. My other, another patient told me, oh, my pain doctor is now my fat doctor. I mean, it's, 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 it's a niche that I'm not certain we really need to gravitate toward. So here we are. Medical schools are urged, as we're all urged to do, with so many things we're lacking in. I mean, you could pick 
any, any subject, and it's great to hit on med schools and say, oh, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, you're not doing this. But I think it is legitimate to say we haven't been teaching nutrition as well, we haven't been teaching tips on how to communicate with patients as well, and we haven't supported ourselves interdisciplinary in this regard, and I hope that we can. So this is a, an American Medical News headline. And here is that wonderful Institute of Medicine, just about 10, 20 years behind the times, but there they go. That, their report is always influential. They want to integrate physical activity every day, every way, for everybody. Making healthy foods available everywhere, marketing what matters for a healthy life. I mean, if you, I mean it's like Sunday school. It's, they, they just want to be nice to everybody. And, but they could have done this in the 70s, you see. Because I always wonder, you know, now the American Academy of Pediatrics and all the other groups have launched this crusade to get sodas out of our schools. Does anybody remember how the sodas got into our schools? I was there. In the late 70s, in Miami, when I was a resident of family medicine, I heard about a school board hearing to address the subject of installing Pepsi-Cola machines in all of the city schools, because this would fund sporting events and athletic facilities. So I went down, and I wasn't able to say much, but I listened to this testimony. One of the members of the school board was a pediatrician, and people were saying, we can't put this, this is not good for kids. And he said, oh, well, they're going to get run over, go on to the corner store across the street. Anyway, we might as well make the money ourselves. And we, kids aren't going to drink milk. So he had, and he was really the strongest advocate for the soda machines. And then the Pepsi-Cola guy got up. And I swear this is what he said. He held up a bottle of Heinz ketchup and said, there is more sugar in a bottle of Heinz ketchup than one of our Pepsis. <laughs> Unanimous vote. For soda machines in our schools, 1977, city of Miami. Does anyone remember Channel One? Channel One? Anybody exposed to it? Did you did you get exposed to it at all? Yeah, in schools. This was a a, a but 15 minute news program that you'd have to sit at your desks and watch, and the teachers would supervise. You actually had to watch. And how could they force you to watch a program? Because they made deals with school boards to install all these great TV uh, sets and uh, a PA system. So they would give the schools this free system that they could also use for announcements. But the exchange was you had to sit there as a captive audience and watch 15 minutes of news uh, rife with food commercials. So I don't know whether we really want to simply now, in retrospect, blame all the soda makers and blame all this, but we have to understand what was the origin of this and not just look at now. Um, Right now, I think it doesn't take an organization. This is an individual author who's written a book on, um, her name is Melinda Southern, co-author of Trim Kids. She's, she's suggested some very simple things. Adopt the motto, after eight is too late. Insist on family dinners. Keep healthy snacks in easy to reach areas. Take homework activity breaks. Redirect children who are doing unhealthy activities. Spend at least a half day each weekend on family activities. Just so simple and elegant, nothing hyped. And um, here is a child, 15, who was 550, 14, 555 pounds, removed from his home, placed in foster care. And the headline, better health classes. You know? <coughs> yeah, you know, we've got 500 satellite TV channels and we need better health classes. I, and, and I think we do. But let's go to school and, and be, let's stock up on school supplies. It, it's as if, you know, the industry and whoever else wants to retain the status quo is just one step ahead of us. Um, why are kids so fat? The answer is all around us. I think this is a very commonsensical, most frequently advertised uh, foods or fast foods, cereal, candy, regular soft drinks, candy bar, restaurant, chewing gum. Um, some of the statistics in here are pr truly amazing. One in four commercials that a child sees is a fast food commercial. Uh, participation in physical education classes dropped sharply in high school. We're talking 90% in grade schools still have physical education, but only, anyone, did, I don't know whether you can see the number there, how many high schoolers get physical education now? On, on average, a third, 34% in the United States. I had mandatory physical education until sophomore year in college. I had to do an obstacle course, and you know, you had to get docked if you missed it. It's, it's just astounding. So this says it all, I would say. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what America means to you. <laughs> Thank you. So, well, we'll just continue with a couple of more. Um, 
we've got the new Krispy Kreme that's being rebuilt around the corner in McFarland, I'm sure, and they're going to have... The good news is zero grams trans fat, but more donuts. And uh, don't this was... Don't this just Krispy Kreme. Okay. <laughs> so the vote is not unanimous. <laughs> uh, so this was in this past Sunday's uh, Sunday newspapers, at least I was up in New York, and this fell out of the paper that I was reading. Um, so that's McDonald's, that's what they want you to buy. And you'll see another one later on. And this is Walmart, the biggest store in the United States. I can't even imagine, this is, I think this is the two liter bottle. 98 cents? Water is, is more expensive than that, I think. Um, drink up. Drink up. Um, and this cartoon from The New Yorker, I guess, sort of says it all as well. I mean, everything is supersized. And I think better than this documentary, with all due respect, is Morgan Sperling supersized. It's over the top, it's propagandistic, but it's a lot of fun to watch. And in terms of solutions, I have my own personal favorite, Jamie Oliver. I know most people, at least in my house, did not like Jane Califer, but I think the guy is really cool. I, I like his approach. He's got a good sense of humor, and he's earnest. Um, take a look at the television statistics. We're talking now, girls and boys, almost neck and neck. Uh, guys watch about 22 hours a week. Uh, this is high school kids who have a TV in their bedroom, and they watch about 18 without the TV in the bedroom. And uh, there are all sorts of numbers out of this thing. Um, they, they don't eat vegetables. The more the TV they watch, the fewer vegetables and fruits they eat. I mean, how they correlate with this is just amazing. And uh, this came out of the Minnesota School of Public Health. This, is, this was one of the most depressing things I saw in, in looking up this uh, story. So, um, not, not too surprising uh, that, there again, the Institute of Medicine, they want to get regulation involved and, um, you know, again, findings a little late in the game. But this is another study that's fascinating. Just by putting a little bowl of, of, of chips in front of kids who are watching TV, and the more food advertisements on the times that they're watching, the more they will nibble and eat. Um, so they've, they've really got it all down to a science. That is the opposition. So naturally, we're going to go for regulation, right? Federal group proposes curbs on marketing food to kids. Truth, justice, and the American regulatory way. And again, I started out as pretty prohibitionistic on the tobacco issue. And I've come a long way away from that viewpoint because we spend so much time working in regulation that we can be doing so much else in the meantime. And naturally, it's not going to be a static issue that if you pass a food, anti food bill, or whatever you call it, <coughs> that the industry is going to say, okay, that's it. All right. This is a dynamic issue, there's a lot of pushback. And there's a lot of gray, as you're about to see. There's a lot of wonderful techniques that the industry can do to, con to, to change our minds in either direction. So the big push has been to kick sodas out of schools. And uh, the Birmingham, the Hoover School System Nutrition Coordinator said young people must learn to choose to eat healthily. And simply moving sweets or pizza from school doesn't help them deal with the bombardment of junk food outside campus. So there are already arguments saying, you know, it's good to think about getting rid of these things. But does that really change anything? And I come from an era when the schools weren't involved in food except for lunch. We didn't supply breakfast to kids. And that's a whole other issue of breakfast pizza and other things that we're giving. And here in Tuscaloosa, um, this, even in this article, money from selling concessions is the only money we have. It's absolutely the only thing we have to keep the doors open. That's pretty bad. I've always wondered why we have school of education, but we still have to truck in kids from Teach for America. But in any event, I think we really need to look at our role in our city schools. I hope our college can play a greater role. Um, and in the Birmingham News, fat profits or fat kids, that's the choice that they're asking. Um, and it's, it's, it's talking about money. Uh, so here is the opposition. Well, here's the industry again. Um, now with fewer calories inside. So they're going to be the good guys. They're going to change. So Coca-Cola and Schweppes and Pepsi are going to join together. How many times have you ever seen an industry join together? Okay. You know that they must at least be on the defensive in some way. So they figured it out. 41% fewer beverage calories in schools. Good news. Isn't that more? Well, the guy on the film uh, says, well, that's just a bait and switch. He's the one that doesn't like juice. He's, he hates juice. I don't agree with him, but he's, ah, they're just, they're just putting in more juice. Well, I mean, you know, that's not the worst thing in the world. But he says, oh, it's the same as soda. I don't agree. But, Margaret, what do you think? Is that, is that the sound of you? But juice is the devil. Juice is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about bottle carries here, Mike. I'm not talking about babies. It's calories. 
his calories. Yeah. Yeah. Bad so brain. fructose is. So but, you're wrong. But, now he did. He did say. <laughs> he did say it's the pulp. It's it's the you know at least if you eat the orange you get the pulp. And, well, there you go. Okay. So we can. We, how about the, the juice with lots of pulp? No. Half grape. Okay. <laughs> I knew. I knew I was going to get. I, I can't win that argument. <laughs> I like fresh squeezed. We're good. Okay. They're not bad. Okay. Everything in moderation. Everything. <laughs> so here, this is my favorite all-time ad. You got the guys trucking in the sodas into the schools. Together, we've reduced beverage calories in schools by 88 percent. I mean, they're bragging about how great they're doing. It's just to me. But here's the real story. At least we've got Mexico. <laughs> so say no more. And Mississippi, Mexico, Mississippi. Should be a poem. Should be a poem about that. But um, around the world, we do have a responsibility. We have a, a budding and more than budding uh, outreach to the world from this college. I'm so impressed by so many people who've gone to trips and to to help in, in, in service in South America and Central America and Africa. But I mean, this is not in, as insidious as let's say the tobacco industry, but it's still there and they're adopting Western uh, cultures in that regard. I've had the privilege of meeting Dennis Burkett, who in his last years actually went around for Kellogg's, talking about the importance of having cereals. And uh, Burkett said uh, two things. So first, you didn't see, he never saw a single case of colon cancer in Africa. And then he also said, if you ask a child in Africa to name three sweets, they would say milk, corn, and fruit. And I thought that was the most poignant and compelling thing about the difference between our culture and a lot of the African cultures. Um, but Coca-Cola is recognized yes. everywhere. Right, and that's what they're working very hard on. But look at their image. They're promoting healthy diets. Hey, if they say it, it must be true. And I'm not going to read what that article says because it's going to come up in another minute. But when you see who they're partnering with, it makes me sick. And Coca-Cola helped put me through med school because at Emory, that's endowed by Coca-Cola. So this is the good news. You'll love Diet Coke. And now it loves you back. Introducing Diet Coke Plus with vitamins and minerals. I couldn't, Saturday Night Live couldn't have made this up. This is actually, I mean, could you, and Publix, available in Publix, get your Coke with the vitamins and minerals. And trendy Diet Coke Plus adds some vitamins and minerals. And there's a whole, this was on the health food page of a newspaper. So, I don't know what to believe. And this was the other side of that Sunday insert this past Sunday of the good guys at McDonald's. Now they're saying, see, Thing is any size. <laughs> they show the little ones, but that means go and you can order your big gulp when you get in there. But so for for publicity purposes, they say now any even a small size, anything is one dollar. Um, and then they have mid caloric drinks. So this is another uh, tactic of saying oh only you know half the calories and half for this and uh, another way. But I think one of the most ominous stories I found was that uh, there is a link between obesity and so-called diet sodas. No one knows the actual reason. Maybe the people who are already diabetic and they are, they're using these and then they only get worse, it doesn't solve any problems. But this is something I hope you'll take away. The diet sodas, what do you think, Mike? Do we agree on this one? No, but uh, I mean, I'd rather <laughs> drink, drink a diet, diet Coke. sodas. Yeah, but I, I would rather than drink Diet Coke than to drink regular Coke. You would think. You know, I'd rather have you do light cigarettes than regular cigarettes. No, it doesn't work like that. Low tar, low... I don't, I don't think you have the, the evidence to... to well, I think there will be. First of all, it creates a sweet tooth. So we're training people to have constant sweets. So my own person, I'd love to continue this debate. This is, to me, the most compelling slide. Then you have the story of a person with a big fat plate and a diet. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Pepsi's going to do a good deed. They're going to not be in U.S. schools, well, if you read the fine print, all over uh, the world by, I think it's like three years from the time, by, this was from 2009, by the way, notice the bottom of USA Today, the front page, was the football. Yeah. Now you can have your, used to be a little sound, now you get a football. But uh, Coca-Cola is not going to sell to children by 2012. We're going to continue to do it for the next three or four years, this is from when they're right, but then we're not going to do it anymore. By that time we'll figure out another way to get it. And, uh, they're going to do health snacks now. So you have a company dedicated for the past hundred years to selling sugary sodas and potato chips and other stuff, which we would call empty calories. Now they're going to suddenly turn around overnight and be the health snack people? I don't think so. Um, but this past week in the Amsterdam News, an African-American paper in New York, 
you begin to see how they're operating. This is Coca-Cola's ad for the boys clubs and girls clubs and how they support them. And they put the ball there to show you that we really support sports. This is another way, exactly like the tobacco industry did throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, where they got the black publishers to come to Philip Morris, and they said we must oppose these constitutional attempts to abrogate uh, cigarette advertising. And this is what is now going on in New York City against Mayor Bloomberg. That's a direct assault on the Bloomberg attempt to at least try to reduce the caloric intake of the average New York child. And to me, this is the most disappointing and saddest slide I've brought. This is from an annual conference of the American Academy of Family Physicians. And it makes you cry to think that in 2009, in spite of fierce opposition by a strong minority of us, the Academy decided that they were going to throw their uh, weight in with uh, Coca-Cola to head up, and other uh, fast food companies, to head up the Academy's public nutrition education campaign. <laughs> providing choices to consumers. Oh, well the candy makers aren't going to be left behind. You remember the Snackwell company? The Snackwells? Remember Snack the gimmick? Half the calories, half the fat? So people ate twice as much. Okay, just wanted to make sure. So that's the that's the, the package size. Well here we have the health industry getting in on the act. Obesity is a national health crisis according to this weight loss uh, proprietary uh, center. So begin to get into this because we could profit from it. And Lap bands are, are in. It's, it's another good way to, uh, this is from uh, Lap Band app. Um, and then you can do both. You can go to these centers, go to this hospital, or that hospital, that hospital, and you can stop smoking in one magic lesson. And, you know, again, another way to get people to utilize their hospital services. How I lost 54 pounds without dieting or medication in less than six weeks. <laughs> Last night I saw something called Sina powder or Sienna powder? Sinsa. Sinsa? Sinsa. Right. Yeah. Just powder it on and lose weight magically. But it's all the time, everywhere. And lose up to 30 pounds in 30 days. You'll see these starting to appear in the fall. 30 pounds, 30 days, $30, about a month before Christmas. You know, that's on all the telephone calls. And I got this in the mail when I returned from my trip uh, just yesterday. Um, this is a way that I can increase my practice income by $20,000 per month to be a diet doctor. What do you think, Jerry? Let's do it. Just got this in the mail yesterday. And let's move on to the pharmacy. Oh, did you sign up? Not yet. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to look at the contract. If they say I can't talk about smoking, you know, I'm finished. But uh, powerful results for new diet pill creates huge demand on pharmacies. Okay, let's walk into the pharmacies and see whether they've got this garbage. And, oh, okay, uh, not exactly helping, you know, um, it, it's beyond me. This is the only country where pharmacies still sell cigarettes. And so CVS and Rite Aid and Walgreens, to my opinion, and one of the saddest things with Jim Myers being taken over by Walgreens, we've really lost an opportunity to have pharmacists as health educators. Walgreens, it's the same thing, week in and week out. I personally urge people, whenever I have a chance, to buy at the independent pharmacies. Um, so now the states are also talking about laws. Here the states are doing regulation and they want to reverse that trend. And uh, they want to put up billboards saying start walking and they want to do good. You know. and, and the first time I actually spoke publicly on this issue, shared some of these slides, was two years ago at the Alabama Summit on Obesity. And, um, and, and people you know, were receptive, but they were gung-ho, they wanted to set up walking trails. None of this has happened yet. And, and they wanted to stop the food deserts. So in New York City, they've pioneered in the soda tax. And this is Kelly Brownell's big thing. Let's tax soda. And this week's American Medical <coughs> News actually has an editorial. They're already counting the dollars. Uh, here's how to spend the money. They're already, you know, and you know what they want to spend the money on? Preventing kids from getting obese. They want to have more exercise promotions. I mean, it's not like we already don't know this. Um, obesity tax aimed to fatten up New York. So wait a minute now. They're using it as a moneymaker. So it's not always altruistic, even a good tech. And this was from last week's Amsterdam News. Are we going to let the bureaucrats tell us what beverages to buy? They're not going to sit back and simply let all these drink taxes and other taxes happen. We have litigation, just as with the tobacco industry. Is fat the next tobacco? Have fat, will sue. Um, oh, I hate to give you the bad news, Rick, but this just appeared in yesterday's paper. Hershey is ordered to pay obese Americans 100, I don't know whether you saw the headline. 135 billion in a class action suit. Oh, wow. Jerry takes a bite out of big chocolate. 
Um, details of Monday's historic ruling, $135 billion in reparations, yeah, to families of chocoholics, additional $27 billion for chocolate education, anti-snacking initiatives, defendant knowingly added nuts nougat to products, product linked to weight gain on high blood sugar, memo reveals intent to target youths, and candy advertising banned on TV. How about that? Is it real? This is from The Onion, the great the satirical oh. newspaper. <laughs> Is that for real? <laughs> we, we rehearsed this before we got here. You're supposed to ask that earlier. Even the Tuscaloosa News had, a, had, a, had, had an editorial about how evil McDonald's, they did a study somewhere and they showed that if you put the same foods in front of kids and you have the McDonald's colors, the kids will, will say these are much better. Just, the, just to have the same exact food, but in different wrapping, they're much better. That's how imprinted they are. So here we have this American icon, and now being called a food bully and being sued. In this cartoon, there are nutrition labels on the wrappers now. What do they say? Proceed directly to your cardiologist. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're, we're scapegoating the Happy Meal, and we're trying to, in LA, they want to zone out uh, some of these establishments and limit the number of fast food. And I'm not saying that's bad, but that's what they're trying to do. In New York, they are trying to get rid of trans fats. A fellow named um, uh, Phil Sokoloff took out full-page ads in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and the USA Today in the 1980s to talk about the poisoning of America with trans fats. He focused on McDonald's and the use of beef tallow in their french fries. And he also focused on Merck in their uh, high-priced anti-cholesterol drugs. And, and he got them to lower the price, and he got McDonald's to take beef tallow out of the french fries. So he took out these ads for about two years at the cost of millions of dollars out of his own pocket. Now, unfortunately, in Huntsville, this doctor lost his job for putting up things like television equal obese child. And um, I'm sorry, that was not from that guy. But he was a, a real proselytizer to kids in the practice in Huntsville, Alabama, about uh, food marketing. And they asked him to leave. Uh, this is how the industry does uh, co combat this. They call it the Consumer Freedom Foundation. Hey, New York, what's next? And it's a slippery slope. Uh, they call it hype. They don't think there's an obesity epidemic. Um, now, the First Lady has done a remarkable job, because I think her approach is looking at the consumer level. And she's gone into cities and shown how food deserts exist and how we have to start selling more fruits and vegetables in the first <coughs> store, even if we have to subsidize them. The problem is she only wants to cut the level by 5%. And I don't think that's a very ambitious goal. So there are some nice talks about more vegetables. And here's Jamie Oliver really, really putting his money where his mouth is, I think, in West Virginia in doing his uh, work. And, and really emphasizing in these food deserts, trying to promote fresh fruits. I asked a woman the other day in a convenience store I was in in upstate New York, how's the fruit selling? She said, eh, you know, not so good. Um, basically, uh, candy is less expensive than bananas. And, and Coca-Cola is certainly less expensive than oranges or bananas. Uh, pricey produce may actually encourage obesity because they can't, people can't afford some of the produce, so they're actually continuing to buy the unhealthy foods. And we have not done well in our state. Fortunately, we have Publix, which has at least got some good food advertising that I hope we can help them, su support them in that. We're trying to institute more exercise programs, uh, and I think that's the good news that we brought. But we have to really look at the fact that we've eliminated physical education in schools. Um, and obesity is a term that arose here in Birmingham in an exercise program pioneered there. And a heart association even endorsed the we for exercise. Uh, the milk, the dairy industry got into this. Let's raise a, a glass of milk to Michelle Obama's Let's Move Her. So it shows you how industry is trying to get in through the back door to look like they're supporting. And this is a good one. Building healthier communities one playground. That sounds good. One playground at a time. Sponsored by Dr. Peck. <laughs> so, you know, you get what you get paid for. And McDonald's now is kicking off a school physical education program. I don't know, when we have McDonald's running school physical education, it might be like Philip Morris running quit smoking programs. And, you know, they're adopting every possible technique they can to be a good guy. So here we are. It's the good and the bad. Advertising is a wonderful force for good. And I hope that that's what we can address both as a college and communicating to the community and to our patients as well. Oh, good morning, because 40% of Coca-Colas are drunk now for breakfast in the Deep South. <laughs>